Okay then, good morning. How are you doing this morning? Who went for a run this morning? That's not so impressive, actually. I was going to con congratulate you all, but, you know. Anyway, glad you can make it. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Martin, um, and I'd like to tell you today just three stories about Redis and Event Machine, about some of the distributed systems that we've been building. Um, I previously worked at New Bamboo. New Bamboo is a, a Rails consultancy down in London, um, and I'm now heading up the development of Pusher. So at New Bamboo over the last uh, year or so, we've been working on um, quite a few uh, product ideas. And, and two products have really come out of that work. Um, they're both cloud-based services. Um, they've been interesting challenges to work on, um, in lots of interesting problems. And um, those are the kind of problems I want to talk to you about today. Um, so the first product that came out was Panda. Um, Panda is a hosted video encoding service. Um, and then Pusher, which I'm now leading, is a hosted um, real-time messaging system. Um, and you'll notice that we're quite proud of our new domain name. All of the three stories I'd like to talk about today um, are all about um, Event Machine and also about Redis. Um, just before I start, I'd like to get an idea of who here has used Redis. Um, Okay, that's brilliant. Practically everybody has used Redis. Um, Redis is awesome. I'm sure you know that already. Um, so what is Redis? Obviously you know that. It's a, an advanced key value store. That's what it says on the website. Um, so you store data in it, right? That's what it's for. Well, we actually only use Redis to store data in a very few little places. Things like storing API keys for really fast lookup, um, things like that. But then actually, Redis is also described as an advanced data structure server. Um, and I think that's getting a bit closer to it. Um, and I was talking to a colleague of mine, and he really said it's kind of like a grab bag of algorithms and super fast in memory structures. And you can kind of just, in an emergency, you can just go in and, and, and get some great tools that will help you solve your problem. Um, and I think that's what I'd like to concentrate on today. Um, some maybe non-standard use cases, things, you know, specific solutions to problems we had. So three stories, as I said. The first story is about auto-assigning roles to processes. The second is about asynchronous communication between processes. And the third is about synchronizing state in your system. So let's get started. So this is about Pusher. And um, first, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the basic architecture of Pusher. Um, because uh, it, that'll make things easier. So at its very core, the idea of Pusher is to make it super easy to send messages uh, from your server to web browsers. And so we've got two components kind of on the left hand side, we've got the API. It's a little Sinatra app, kind of standard. You send messages to it via a REST API. They get sent to a message bus in the middle. and then. Those messages then get sent to socket servers, and those servers maintain concurrent, uh, persistent connections um, with large numbers of browsers. Okay, so in the system, there are lots of operations happening all the time, right? There's kind of people, you know, hundreds of people connecting and disconnecting, sending messages, sending messages up the pipe, sending messages down the pipe, and um, the important thing for us is to be able to measure what's happening and to have an idea of the usage of the system. Um, that's very important because um, the billing information is based on that. So we, we, we bill based on message volume and, and, um, and that kind of thing. And also, it means that we can give our users very nice analytics. And, and that's actually uh, very useful because um, when all your, when all your uh, clients are connecting in, uh, connecting with these persistent connections with your service, you, you um, you get a lot of real-time information that you, can, that, you can, that you can use very easily. So we, are, we want to collect these statistics. And Redis seems like a great place to store statistics. It's non-blocking. We can really, really quickly um, store the statistics. We can um, use incrementers to, to, to update values atomically. Um, and that's great. But that's not really what I want to talk to you about. Um, 
what I really want to talk about is how, how we store those um, statistics in the long term. So Redis is great for storing things right here, right now, and getting them out of your process really fast without blocking any operations. Um, but really, we'd like to store that data in a database so that we can archive it and we can query it uh, you know, however way we want to. So the question is really, how does the data get from Redis to, to SQL? Um, well, it doesn't really matter um, who, um, who sends that data. It's, it's, not a, it's not a really difficult job. It's not a job that has to happen um, super, super quickly. It's just kind of a background process. We need to get some, read some data from Redis and, and write it into the database. But what we don't want is that multiple processes are doing this at the same time. Because then in our code, we have to write lots of locking code, and it gets really ugly. And you know, what if we read data from Redis at the same time and try and push it into the database? You know, we don't want to do that. Um, so it should be a single process right, that does this. Um, but we should be isolated from failure. We don't want this process dying, and then suddenly you know, there are no statistics for several days. What are we going to do? Um, and ideally, I don't really want to configure it. Um, because if I have to configure it, it will go wrong. And if it fails, then I have to change the configuration. And that's going to be a real pain. So we're kind of um, inspired here by something that Netflix um, put out. And they, they, um, they, they wrote a blog post about this thing they've, called, they've got called Chaos Monkey. And uh, Chaos Monkey just sits, base, sits in their AWS cloud, and it just randomly goes and terminates instances and terminates services. And I think that's a, a great way of thinking about it. You know, if you want to survive failure, um, the best way to avoid failure is to fail constantly. Uh, that's what they said. Um, and so, how, how do we how, how do we solve this problem? So, the um, the inspiration for this really came from, um, from the chubby paper that Google put out. Um, so they, they use it as a lock service so that they can do this, solve these same kinds of problems. So they had uh, lots of different, um, they have obviously huge distributed systems at Google, right? And um, one of the quotes from the paper is they said, before chubby, most distributed systems used um, ad hoc methods for primary election or required operator intervention in, in case of failure. Um, so they were having to write this ad hoc code all the time um, that, that, allowed, um, that allowed instances in a distributed system to elect a master process. So the master process is responsible for you know, um, you know, some, some, key complex, some key operation, OK? Um, and there's, there's some papers on this. Um, Paxos, the protocol, if you've read that, is, is kind of the most um, commonly used. Um, but one of the interesting things that Google says in the Chubby paper is that it's actually they decided not to use a kind of distributed um, a, a, a process, that, a distributed consensus uh, protocol for, for defining the master. They said, actually, it's just easier to use a lock, right? So it's a central process. And so we thought, well, if a central, a central lock is good enough for Google, it's going to be good enough for us. So obviously, the central lock um, in Chubby is, is, is resilient to failure, right? Um, they've got, uh, uh, I think they say that they have five, um, they have, uh, five kind of slaves or five uh, Chubby processes. Uh, communicating, and at least three of those must be up in order for the service to be up. But it means that they don't have to worry about kind of consensus in their actual processes um, to define who the master process is. They can, they can simply query this lock, and the lock will tell them, and the lock will, will say, yes, you have the lock, you can do this job. Okay. So what we thought is, I thought, this is great. I bet I could build this in Redis, right? So. The simplest way to build a lock in Redis is to use the set NX operations. Um, I'm going to use this style. Can you read this text, actually? Is it OK? OK, good. Um, I'm going to use this style. Um, I'm sorry about the dollar marks at the front. It's something to do with show off. 
it will only give me these nice kind of command line prompts if I use dollars, okay. So set an X basically says set this key if it doesn't already exist, right? So nobody has the lock right now. Um, I'd like to assign myself the lock and I'm going to, um, the, the value there is a timestamp. So that's, that seems to be a usual way of doing things. Um, that will re reply with either a one if the operation succeeded or a zero if the operation failed, right? So returns one, we've got the lock, great. When I go away, when I you know, want to shut down, I can delete the lock, that returns okay. Um, that's fine, right? Uh, some other process can come along and claim the lock. Um, if another process tries to claim the lock at the same time, then it returns zero, it didn't get the lock, okay, you're getting the picture. But obviously there's an issue here. Um, if there are multiple processes, um, some processes might just die without cleaning up their state, and there's a lock there that, that hasn't been cleaned up. And, um, there's, and the algorithm that I'm going to describe is, is described um, in, actually in the Redis documentation, in the documentation for set MX. Um, the idea is that we start off as before, um, we attempt to acquire the lock, but that fails, okay. So we say, well, maybe a process died and didn't clean up its state. So the lock contains a timestamp, and that is the expiry time of the lock, whatever the process that, that originally um, set the lock defined as the expiry time. Um, so I can fetch that value, fetch T1, and, and check whether T1 is in the past or if it's in the future. If it's in the future, then okay, somebody else has the lock, that's fine, we'll stop. Um, if it's in the past, we'll say, okay, we're going to try and acquire a lock ourselves. Um, so we'll, set a, we'll define a new expiry time, um, T2, which is, for example, right now, plus um, five minutes, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, and then what get set does, it's one of these nice atomic operations within Redis, um, which allows you to get a key and, well, set a key, and return the value of that that key previously held at the same time. And so, um, in this case, it returns T1, the old value of the lock, and we can compare it with um, the value that we got previously and say, well, okay, that timestamp hasn't changed, therefore nobody else tried to acquire the lock at the same time. Um, and so to see how that kind of works, if another process does the same thing, um, when they call get set at the bottom right, um, they'll get the new timestamp um, T2 in response, which means that um, basically they failed to acquire the lock. So that's basically the algorithm we, work, we used, and it works great. Um, the new version of Redis actually has a very nice feature which I'd like to talk about, which is a little bit of an aside, um, which are transactions. Um, so in the previous slide, it's kind of a, it's kind of a pain, you know, it's, code ends up looking a little bit messy because, of, because you can actually clean it up a lot using transactions. So um, there's actually still quite a lot of commands, but the idea here is really that um, we start in the same way as pre previously. We call set NX. If we return one, then we've got the log. Otherwise, we return zero. Okay. Um, and then what we'd like to do really is we'd like to... Um, Redis uses a style of locking uh, called optimistic locking. Um, rather than kind of pessimist, pessimistic locking, which is maybe more common, um, which says that you know, rather than uh, locking the value of the of the of the lock, sorry about the that, um, rather than creating a lock and then saying, okay, nobody else can change that data because I'm I'm it's mine, okay. Um, rather than that, you just say, I'm going to watch this data and then I'm going to perform a load, load of operations and then I'm going to perform them atomically and if that if that uh, value I was watching changed then fail. Um, if it didn't change, then that's fine, you know, then everything's consistent and you can process those, those commands atomically. So the idea here is you call it watch, watch is the uh, lock, and then uh, we call get. If we get an old timestamp, uh, we call multi, this is kind of X starts the kind of atomic block of operations. Uh, we set a new, a new uh, key, a, a, new, a, a new T2 expiry time, and we call exec. Exec will either fail or succeed, depending on whether that uh, lock was modified by another process or not. Okay. 
It's actually um, maybe a little bit simpler to look at the commands. So this is as before. When we watch, it says, OK, you're watching, fine. Call get. That returns, right? We're not in a kind of a multi exec block yet. Then we call multi. So all further commands, um, instead of being executed right now, they just get queued up by Redis for execution at a future point in time. Um, and then we call exec and they get executed. Um, and you can do um, really quite interesting um, things with this. Um, you can watch one or more keys, and you can uh, execute many transactions within uh, the multi-exec block. So you can really create a really nice kind of atomic primitives for yourself. So I think it's time to look at some Ruby. Um, so we're going to do this, right? No. Event machine callbacks. OK. Who was in the talk yesterday by uh, Matthias? OK, that's really great. I was hoping that practically everyone would have gone to that talk, because um, it was great. And it means I don't have to explain a whole lot of stuff. So, so right, we're using Event Machine. How are we going to do this? Um, there's a Redis. Uh, there are at least two uh, Event Machine Redis clients. Um, I wrote EM High Redis because I wasn't really happy with the old EM Redis um, gem. Um, ask me later if you want to know why. Um, I'm going to use it for the duration purely because I, I know it and um, it's fairly similar in terms of interface. So I'm going to skip a whole load of the kind of uh, boilerplate code in the slides. Um, but basic idea with Event Machine is you always run things inside a reactor loop. Um, you, if I haven't defined the connection, um, that means that is um, it's an instance of EM High Redis client. Um, <clears throat> and it's, um, it's got the kind of callback style that you'd expect in Event Machine. You call get, you call any, any Redis operation against a key, um, and it returns a value for you asynchronously. Um, optionally, you can provide um, callback and errorback um, blocks to redis.get or any other operation, in fact, um, because it returns a deferrable, which allows you to bind to success and failure separately, if that's useful for you. Um, right. So, So what's the interface that we'd like? And this is something I'd quite like to talk about a little bit today, is that um, I think Matthias mentioned yesterday, often Event Machine gets a bad, bad name and Node and other such, such frameworks, mm -hmm. because you get all these callbacks, right? It's, it's all these callbacks, and, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's a problem to some people. Um, but what I'd like to say is, actually, you don't really need to have the, you can kind of abstract the callbacks away from your main code in most cases. And so the kind of interface that I'd like for a lock is something like this, right? I uh, say, OK, I'm going to create a new lock. Um, I'm going to define the key. It's called my lock. And 60, which is the timeout. So I'm going to um, set my timeout value 60 seconds in the future, which means I, when I acquire this lock, I will have it for 60 seconds. And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, basically a call back if I managed to acquire the lock successfully. or if the lock didn't acquire, then I'd like to get an error back. So rather than worrying about the kind of complexities of the operations that are actually happening against Redis, I'd like to just, just get these kind of simple uh, callbacks and errorbacks. Um, and this is uh, quite a common uh, style in Event Machine, is to, rather than returning true or failure, or returning true or raising an exception, um, to return an object that completes or fails sometime in the future. So this is the code that, this is the kind of uh, core bit of the code for the Redis lock. Right? This is the algorithm we were talking about earlier. Um, we're, uh, sorry about the amount of code, it's just like that. Um, as you can see, it's kind of nested, lots of callbacks, kind of horrible. But the point is, we don't have to worry about that in our actual interface. That's good. Um, we're calling get. Uh, we're checking the expiry time, if it's in the past. Uh, we're calling get set, and then we're looking at the value returned by get set, and then depending on that, we're either, uh, we're either acquiring the lock or failing to acquire the lock. Um, 
What I've done here as well is you'll notice that uh, inside the Redis lock class, um, I'm including EM deferrable, which is, um, which is one way you can use an event machine of making an instance have this property of failing or succeeding sometime in the future. So if we look at the code, we're basically attaching a callback and an error back to the lock itself. And so um, it's kind of two thirds of the way down, we're calling fail. So that's the, that will basically end up triggering, triggering the error back block. And, and then in our lock acquired method, um, there we've got a call to succeed at the bottom and that will end up, um, that will call the callback. Okay. Um, another thing that's quite common is rather than kind of making a whole class deferrable itself, um, just return a deferrable from a method call. Um, and so the unlock method um, I implemented happened to, to work like that. Um, so event machine comes with this thing called a default of deferrable, which is kind of a, uh, just a really simple class that mixes in deferrable. And, um, and I ended up doing this quite a lot. Uh, at, the start of the at the start of the method definition, um, just define a new deferrable object. Doesn't have any, it doesn't have any logic, doesn't know anything about the problem. It's just you know, a thing that can um, accept callbacks and errorback functions. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, depending on, you know, so if we manage to delete the lock, then we succeed at that deferrable. And so we can return that deferrable to our, to our calling method um, at, and then attach a callback and an errorback function. And then when those deferrables fail or succeed, those callbacks get called. Um, it's not an ideal interface because um, what I was talking about at the start was that I'd like to kind of be able to elect a master process effectively. I'd like to say, okay, this process is going to be in charge of this operation and um, ideally I would like to do that kind of at the start of the lifetime of a process and it could just say, okay, am I ma I'm either master or not and periodically it could check, you know, do I need to become the master? Has another node failed? Um, I don't really want to be acquiring and then losing the lock and all this stuff all the time. And we want to keep the uh, expiry time of the lock fairly short, you know, 60 seconds, something like that. Um, because if one of these processes fail, we'd like, um, we'd like that lock to expire and for that role to be taken over by another process relatively quickly. And so, we ended up kind of wrapping up that code again and again kind of um, uh, bundling up a whole load of callbacks inside a nice object that we could use, uh, which I called a persistent lock. Uh, we gave the persistent lock a timeout, which is the, <coughs> the, 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 the timeout for the underlying lock. And then also um, a kind of polling interval between successive attempts to acquire a lock. And then we get a very simple interface, really, um, on locked and on unlocked. Um, and that's another common pattern you'll see in a lot of event, event machine code, is your, um, if a deferrable object is not kind of suitable for whatever reason, um, you'll, find, you'll find people kind of att attaching um, on event handlers, um, kind of very similar to a kind of JavaScript way of doing things. Um, so in our code, you know, we're, we're interested in, you know, being this process that can synchronize locks, uh, sorry, synchronize statistics to, from Redis to MySQL. You know, we can just write this code and, and just really simply, we, we get a, a callback fired um, if we're the master process. Um, and then when we fail to be the master process, um, we get another call. So I think this is actually makes um, this code really understandable, actually. And uh, in many ways, Event Machine gives you a very elegant abstraction, actually. It allows you to write these kind of, um, this kind of code that's, as, as long as you kind of have, have abstracted away the kind of the, com the complexity in, 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 with a simple interface, um, you can look at the code and, and really simply understand what's going on. And we end up using this for quite a few different tasks within Pusher, and it works, works really great. Um, one of the big advantages is that, it, as I said, it means we're toler tolerant to failure. Um, 
rather than having to worry about stopping instances, stopping nodes, um, it's really just kind of, it's just easy to, you don't have to worry about, was this process responsible for that task? Uh, do I need, should I maybe not stop it? Maybe I should kind of stop that cleanly first or what have you. You can just kind of boot up another instance, kill one of the old instances, and things just kind of work. Um, it's a lot more resilient. So the next story is about um, asynchronous communication between processes. And this is in the context of Panda. So Panda, as I said before, it's a, vid it's a hosted video encoding service. Um, people send videos, upload videos to Panda. Um, those videos are encoded, and then they're stored on S3, um, and it provides you a lot of callback functions, uh, uh, kind of webhooks when those different events happen, all that kind of thing. So obviously one of the core kind of concerns in, in Panda is to be able to encode videos, right? So we obviously have a huge number of pandas that sit around encoding videos. It's kind of obvious. Um, so we'd call those encoders from now on. Uh, now the way we price panda and sell it is we, we, we give people virtual encoders, virtual pandas if you will. Um, and we, so a, a, given, a given customer maybe purchases five virtual encoders. And what that means is that if they have five or more videos in their queue to encode, they end up encoding exactly five videos. Right? Um, and it means that we don't end up provisioning a whole lot of resources for users that are kind of not currently requiring to, vid to process any videos. And we just have to make sure that in our system we've got sufficient resources so that we can always, um, we can always uh, satisfy the demand for, for actual encoders at any given point in time. So this is kind of what I'm describing. So we've got maybe a user, a red user, and the red user has a, um, a coding, encoding capacity of three. So we've got three of these encoders down on the right-hand side. Um, three of those are active. Um, say the blue user has an encoding capacity of two, um, but they've only got one video right now encoding. They've got nothing in their queue and so this kind of thing. Um, and so. What we'd like is that when any one of these um, um, jobs completes, uh, we've finished encoding a video, we'd like um, to automatically assign a new job for that user if, if they have space in, the, in, the, in, the, in, a, in their allocation of encoders. And when a new job arrives in the system, um, we'd like to kind of immediately push that um, into, into one of the, the available encoders. And so in many ways, this problem is kind of a classic kind of queuing problem, right? Um, and in many ways, you would solve this by using delayed job or Beanstalk or a library like that. Um, you just have a queue of work that has to, do, that has to happen, and you're going to do it as, as and when you have resources. But Panda is a little bit different, as I've described, in that you end up queuing, especially having a queue for every user. and um, it's not always necessarily trivial to determine which encoder should take on which job next. Um, initially, we did this with a whole lot of kind of database logic in each encoder. Um, but that was kind of a horrible solution because the complexity of this just kept getting bigger and bigger, and we wanted to kind of optimize the placement of encodings in the, in the, in the system. And you end up putting a load, of, a load of logic in all your encoders, and they have to kind of poll the database, so it's not a push-based model. Um, and, and, and it's just, as you scale the number of encoders, it just kind of gets unmanageable. Right? So what we do really like to do is have a kind of a way of kind of pushing those jobs, which is why we introduced this, this single manager process. Um, so the manager process has a knowledge of all of the queues for all of the users, what, what jobs are waiting, and it has knowledge of all of the different encoders in the system, 
um, who's encoding what videos uh, for which clients and which encoders are free. And we'd also like to be able to um, to be able to boot up a new encoding instances and have all of those kind of uh, encoders just automatically available and not have to kind of configure anything. Just the manager should just automatically be aware of what's, what's, of, of what's available. And so we wanted to have this kind of asynchronous communication um, between the manager and all of the different coders in the system. So the manager could ask an encoder, what's his status? And uh, they should reply, well, I'm busy or um, you know, I'm doing something else. Um, they should be able to say, you know, I've completed the video, all this kind of thing. Um, synchronous commu communication is kind of a bad idea in this context because encoding a video is kind of a, kind of a, often a blocking operation and, and you, they're not going to respond very quickly and you don't know where they are even if you did. And so uh, having an asynchronous method is, just works so much better. And so the way we did this is we solved it using Redis lists. So Redis lists very quickly. Um, they allow extremely cheap O1 operations for pushing and popping onto a list, right? So we can push um, an item onto a list. Um, we can pop that item off the list again. Uh, if we try to pop an item off a list that's already empty, it returns nil. And we can also do these kind of blocking pop operations. And uh, what this means is that rather than having to keep kind of popping all the time and saying, you know, is there, you know, is there, is there anything new on the list? Is there anything new on the list? You know, is there new communication for me yet? You don't have to do that. You can just kind of blocking pop and you will receive a call, a, 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 um, you'll receive, you'll be notified when that, uh, when, when something arrives on that list. And so this is the kind of Ruby interface. Um, BR pop, blocking write pop operation. And, and in this case, we end up returning nil, uh, which is what Redis returns um, if, it, if it kind of timed out. Um, so if it timed out, it was, if it returns nil, it was a timeout. Otherwise, uh, we got a value. Right? OK, so same as before, getting rid of the callbacks. What do we do? Right, so we need an object uh, to handle this. OK, we call it a postbox. Every process has a postbox. So, What's the really nice interface for this? Well, on message, right? I've got a post box, and all I want to know as a process is when am I going to get a message, right? In, under the hood, we'll use blocking pop, so it means that when I send uh, a message to a user, to, sorry, when I send a message to a process, that process is immediately notified of that. Um, this is just kind of the boilerplate code for that class. Um, allows us to attach a non-message callback and it allows us to send a message just by doing an L push onto a list. Right? This is the listen method, which, um, as you can see, does the blocking um, write pop operation, um, checks to see whether it was a timeout. Um, in all cases, it ends up calling itself again in the callback um, after it completes. So this, 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 kind of, this listen call just kind of endlessly circulates. Um, in the real world, you probably want to kind of have some method of telling this class to stop at some point, but I kind of skipped over that. Right. So, but again, you know, maybe this API is still not really perfect. I mean, all of this, all this allows us to do is to attach an on-message handler. Um, but maybe I have different parts of my code base that are responsible for different operations. So, uh, one part of the code base is responsible for. Um, I don't know, receiving new jobs that require require work. Um, maybe another part of the code is responsible for retreat, retreat, for uh, handling um, kind of job complete calls from encoders, right? So again, just kind of shape the API to fit the problem. Um, so in, in Panda, we ended up with an interface something like this. Um, we allowed it to create a postbox for a process. So this is the manager process. We create a new post box for it, and then we can just kind of register for these kind of different callbacks that we're interested in. So we say, well, you know, new encoder, do something. So one class in the system maybe registers for this call, and in another part of the code base, we register for the job complete. And in the encoder, you know, things look basically the same. 
So the advantage of this was um, the manager gave us a very really clear global view of the system. Um, we had the asynchronous communication within Redis worked really great, and um, the system ended up being very resilient to failure. Um, encoders could fail in the middle of processing job. Um, because we were querying their status, we'd find out, oh, this, this encoder's vanished. Okay, we'll reschedule that job for somebody else. Um, and actually, we're even resilient to manager failure because all that communication to the manager goes over Redis lists. And so, if the manager for some reason fails um, or doesn't receive any communication, we can just boot it up again, and all of those kind of all that 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 mailbox is stored in Redis, and it can retrieve all the new events that happened in the system and process them accordingly. Zero configuration scaling. Okay, how am I doing for time? Not great. Okay, so last story really, really quickly. This is actually a really fun one, um, so hopefully we'll get through it. So this is about synchronizing shared state, right? So in Pusher, we have, have this feature called the debug console, and the debug console allows you to log into your account, click on the debug console, and see all the events that are happening in your system. So you'll see that users are connecting, they're disconnecting, they're subscribing to channels, unsubscribing to channels, they're sending messages, messages have been delivered, all this kind of thing. So this is extremely useful for people, especially when they're developing their applications. Um, they can just, if something's not happening, they're working the way they expect, they can just log onto this page um, and see exactly what's going on. The problem is that they're kind of supporting this um, for a, for a for a busy application, there could be hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of operations per second happening in the system. And so exposing all of this data is just a shed load of information to push over the message bus. And so really what we'd like to know is which, you, which uh, users have a debug console open right now? Because there's a whole load of extra work I'd like to, I, I need to do in the case that they have that open. So the, maybe the simplest way to think about this is, well, let's just use a set, right? So we have a set in Redis, really, really cheap, uh, O1 adding, removing, um, and querying to see whether an element is a member of a set. Um, the problem with using a set is that, okay, um, if you have uh, a user and they have multiple debug consoles open, and multiple tabs in their window, then um, when one of those closes, you need to know whether that was the last one, right? And so you can't just remove from a set at that point because maybe they already had one open. So the solution to that is to use sorted sets. Um, a sorted set is, very simply, it's a set where every element has a score associated to it. And it allows very cheap um, kind of range uh, queries by score or by index and that kind of thing. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of skip over this really quickly. Um, basically, we can query a, a, the score of an element um, so we can query, you know, uh, app ID 42, it's nil, okay, that means uh, we, you know, it's not even in the set, okay. So that means the de debug console is not open. Um, when someone opens the debug console, we can call zincre by, um, by, increment by one, um, that returns one. That's the new score of that element. That means somebody has their debug console open. Okay, we can query that. Um, we can get ranges, see all the, all the elements that have at least one all the apps that have at least one debug console open, and then we can kind of keep incrementing and decrementing, and you get the idea. Okay, so the question is, how do we know if a debug console is open? So we have this kind of distributed system, API processes, socket server processes, and they're all kind of doing work, and they're all receiving subscriptions and unsubscriptions, and they'd kind of like to know whether they need to tell, uh, kind of broadcast that, that information to the debug console. Um, so as, as I broadcast that information to the message bus so that people can kind of view it. Um, so we could definitely do this by calling Z-score, which is a really nice atomic operation, tells us in a, in a cheap way, whether that, uh, in a constant time way, whether, whether the console is open or not. However, we end up doing that a lot, okay? So we solved the problem using the atomic operations to, to have a kind of consistent view of whether the, 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 a, a, an application has a debug console open or not but we kind of haven't really solved the problem entirely. So really what we'd like to do is to be able to push that change, right? 
Um, instead of each process requesting that over and over and over again, we just like to tell them, okay, it changed. And Redis comes to the rescue again. Um, Redis PubSub is really, really great. It's really performant. It's really simple. It just solves um, problems really nicely. Um, the idea here is that if you're interested in the fact that the set of debug consoles open changed, then you can just subscribe to that. Um, and so PubSub allows us to really easily decouple the system. We can just say, when, when the set changes, we can publish a, a notification, and then any process that's interested in that event can very easily uh, subscribe. So again, skipping quickly over the interfa in interface, we can call subscribe against a channel, and uh, that returns a result. Um, so, well, it returns a subscription result. Um, we can subscribe again if we want to do. Um, we can publish. Uh, we pu publish to that channel the foobar message. Um, that ends up telling us um, how many um, subscriptions received, how many subscribers there were that received that message, which is, can be quite useful. Um, and then what happens is when you call subscribe, that, that Redis process blocks and uh, can no, you can no longer use it kind of as a normal communications channel, um, but that just basically receives messages whenever they arrive in the system. Okay, so the interface for EMHI Redis is very simple. You just subscribe, you can keep subscribing and subscribing on the same connection as many times as you like, and then you just receive a message um, whenever a message is sent to the PubSub channel. And uh, you get told the channel and the message, okay? Skip that. And so this is what we want to do, right? We want to publish when it's open or closed. And so we can do this because of the fact that the incrementer operations in Redis return the new value of that, the new score of that value. We can really easily and atomically, which is important, um, when, when a new console is opened, we can increment by one, and then the new score is returned to us. If that score is one, it means that previously it was definitely zero. And so this is new, the set changed, we can publish that event, right? Exactly the same on, on close. If the new score is zero, that means we closed. And this means that what we'd like to do is we'd like to update an in-memory list. So rather than querying Redis all the time, um, if we're interested as a process in the fact that that list changed, we can just subscribe to that event. So we can, you know, say subscribe, um, and then when we get that, um, a message on that channel, we can just say, okay, um, give me all of the um, consoles that have score between one and infinity, and we'll store that in an array in memory, um, and we can just query that kind of almost free. And so to wrap up, the atomic operations were extremely useful for this. Um, it meant that we could have this distributed state in the system and have it change, it, change that as distributed state atomically, um, which is important so that we could publish those events. Um, the PubSub just made it really easy to propagate that state across the system uh, and, made, and made sure that we could decouple the components. Right? If a new process arrives and we need to write a new process that cares about the state of those, of, of those debug consoles, we can use this. Um, and we've used this for a lot of different, for kind of different data in the system, not just this debug consoles. And it's, it's been a really flexible tool. So, just that, that's perfect timing. Thanks for coming. Have you got any questions? Yeah. No. <laughs> Don't block the event loop. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with it for doing message passing. Um, well, you end up with basically one um, connection. You, uh, if, you're, if you're doing subscriptions, you can subscribe to multiple channels over the same Redis connection. Uh, so you can kind of keep calling subscribe and unsubscribe and kind of changing your subscriptions in real time. And so you, you usually end up with one connection which is kind of blocking on some operation and then one connection which you are using to send, to send kind of other messages. Yeah. Um, right, that's a good question. 
Um, so Redis has a very nice feature um, for slaving. So I can, if I can just boot up a new instance of Redis and slave off another instance. And so we end up having an, at least one slave for the data. And um, all of the operations are sent to that slave as they happen. Um, and so it's kind of always kept up to date. Um, and then you can do um, a certain, well, if you want to, you can build a kind of auto failover system in, in, in that. Um, we haven't. Uh, we could have done that, for the, especially for the statistics. We could have used expires. Um, we ended up, and as I said, we're kind of storing it transiently in Redis. So we're actually only storing it for about five minutes. Um, and then we're flushing it to the database so that, then, so that we can give people near real-time statistics. Mm -hmm. Yes, that could probably work. Yeah, that is fairly new. Yeah, I haven't used that, but that would probably work. It's a good idea, yeah. Anything else? Okay, great. Thanks very much.